to help with the adjustment of living this lifelong condition. This motivated her to want to contribute to the organization and particularly um, in helping young people and adjusting to living a full celiac, uh, a full life with celiac disease. Um, having recently graduated from Otago University, Rosie understands the curveballs that celiac disease can throw when transitioning into adult life. Um, welcome, Rosie, and look forward to hearing your presentation. Well, thank you very much, Lisa, for the introduction. Um, Yes, hello everyone, I'm Rosie. Um, I have recently moved to Auckland this year. Um, I'm from down south, so grew up in Christchurch. Um, and then I did my, I did four years of study at Otago University, um, so in Dunedin. Um, and yeah, I've recently made the move up north. So have tried my hand. I've lived in Wellington as well during my student years. So I've tried my hand at a few of the different lifestyles in New Zealand. Um, so I guess I'll get into, I thought I'd start with kind of my transitions um, from kind of the high school life of living with your family and, and kind of having, um, oh, Lisa, I'll just get you go to just a slide on if that's okay. I'll get you go to the next one, actually, if that's all right. Thank you. Um, so, yes, so when I moved to university, I moved straight into the tertiary halls um, as at Hamish. Um, so that's a bit of a factor when people are choosing where to go. So for me, when I was um, journeying around the Otago Halls, um, a really large factor for me of choosing where I was going to go was being able to access safe food. Um, and so that kind of ruled out a little bit for me some of the bigger halls in Dunedin. Um, it might be different these days, I'm not sure. So, you know, don't take my experience for it if anyone's got children looking to go or are looking to go themselves. Um, but yeah, I found that the smaller halls who did their own catering in-house were able to cater for me and my needs a lot better. Um, so a key part of, of making this work for myself was having those conversations pr like before ha going. So having those emails to um, make sure I was really certain this was the right place for me to be. Um, I ended up at Knox College um so I on the first day as Hamish said that he maybe wishes he'd done I'd gone to the chef at the hall and introduced myself and explained you know have, have you heard of celiac disease before um this is what it is this is what it does for me um so it's really important that um you know not just eating gluten-free foods but that it's free from contamination um, and so I think making that kind of personal contact and putting a face to this gluten-free number of however many people they're ticking off, I think that makes people maybe feel a little bit more accountable and and that, you know, if they've got someone that they're kind of looking out for, then it, it's probably quite helpful. Um, so I ended up kind of making best friends really with the chef and, and each, each night he'd be like, hey, Rosie, come on in, this is your meal over here. And he'd He'd ask me, oh, so did you like that one last night? Or, or you know, should I make that one again? So it, it really benefited me a lot, um, getting in there and making that connection. Um, but, I mean, the reality of it is in halls is that you can't, you are losing that control and that kind of autonomy over your food. So while you are gaining a whole lot of independence in a lot of ways, you're also losing a bit of independence in that way as well and that you can't, control what you're eating so you um have got to learn to be quite open-minded to different things and I often ended up being lumped in as being a vegan um just because you know in terms of resourcing they don't want to be cooking a separate meal for the gluten-free people the vegan people the dairy-free people the vegetarians so often you know the gluten-free option was also the vegan option so um that made for a really interesting lasagna if it had no gluten no dairy no meat <laughs> It's pretty much 
a gluten-free pasta sheet with a swipe of tomato paste on it. Um, so I'd say, you know, you can't be too precious um, in those situations. And sometimes you've just got to look at it as character building experience. Um, and then the other flip side of that is that it's really good idea to have your own food stocks, um, your own wee pantry in your wardrobe. I'd always have some like tins of salmon or tuna and some of the little rice bottles so that if whatever was for dinner was just too too far gone, then there was always that option. Um, because as everyone's aware, when you're when you're a student, you're on a pretty tight budget. So um, you know, you don't really have the luxury to go out and get takeaways if if whatever is for dinner doesn't take your fancy. Um, so yeah, I'd say, you know, that's the kind of food side of things, but then there's a huge adjustment period moving away from your family and away from your support network as well. And so um, there's a massive adjustment in terms of um, like mental health and everything as well, um, which, you know, isn't necessarily directly related to celiac, but um, oftentimes it can be a bit of a separating factor. Like food is such a joining thing for us as humans. Um, so, you know, you can feel a little, little bit exposed if you're having to remove yourself from those such a sort of situations. So being with people that you haven't met before and um, having those sort of interactions is definitely um, definitely something to work through and to like be kind to yourself about and um, give yourself a bit of leeway to, um, to not always feel 100% comfortable, but then kind of pick yourself up by your bootstraps and know that I can just sometimes feel a bit uncomfortable and say what my needs are even though it feels like quite a forward conversation to be having with someone that you've literally just met but you've got to do what you've got to do and it's good character building at the end of the day um so then moving on from the halls um we moved into flatting um so I've flatted for four years now and I've done so when I was entering into flatting I wanted to, before we even talked about flatting together, I really wanted to highlight that I was celiac and that that would, whether people liked it or not, would end up being a factor of living with me. So I said, you know, if that's not for you, that's totally cool and I'll never hold it against you. But if you're wanting to live with me, then things are going to have to be just like, you're going to have to respect that, say that that shelf will be my shelf and and certain boards can be used for certain things and others can't. and if that's not for you, then that's okay. But, you know, we need to talk about it right from the start. So I think opening that dialogue at the beginning was really important for me. And I thankfully had incredible friends who really understood and really cared for me. Um, and so I've actually flat cooked my whole way through uni. So my, my flatmates would cook gluten-free meals for me. And I'd just generally because obviously there's a bit of a price differential as I'm sure everyone's more than aware bit of a price differential between gluten-free products and um non-gluten-free products so I'd kind of I'd compromise by like I'd supply the gluten-free pasta even if it wasn't me cooking but I'd always make sure there was gluten-free pasta that people could get to and like gluten-free buns and all that kind of thing if it was burger night um so that was kind of how I made it not a burden on other people so much um and so yeah I guess a lot of people going into flatting had heard vaguely of celiac but didn't understand that it wasn't just kind of like a little bit of a sore stomach at the time like it has quite a lot of long-term circum um long-term consequences for people and so kind of taking the time to explain that to people and because they care about you they then in turn will you know hopefully take an active interest in trying to protect you in that so I always found my friends really really good and really really conscientious um, with how we worked the kitchen in flatting um, but obviously an option is also to fend for yourself and not everyone's going to want to cook gluten-free and that's totally fair enough um, so figuring out whatever works for you um, but yeah I think some things some systems in the flat that really helped me were like having a separate toaster um and that i'd always have a little sign on rosie's toaster gluten free so that if any new people are in the flat that they weren't just chucking their toast in and i'd always have a wee cloth on top of the 
toaster as well um so that again like not crumbs are getting in um and there's kind of that extra even if someone comes home completely drunk and wanting some toast then they're still not going to reach for your toaster because there's a physical barrier that they have to remove um so that helped and then also having separate shelves um with mine being the top shelf so if they're making pasta with flour or whatever then the flour isn't going to cover all my food by mistake because mine's above it so not a problem for me um also going for plastic chopping boards as opposed to wooden chopping boards because flats can be known for not cleaning things amazingly well so um that's just an easy way that you know you're not gonna get kind of residue into the board if it's a plastic board um also in terms of budget buying naturally gluten-free foods has been my main tactic in terms of cooking good meals healthy meals on a budget with celiac um so you know if it's chickpeas lentils potatoes rice as opposed to like whenever i find that my uh meal costs if i'm making something with pastas and um with burger burger buns and things like that you know my meal cost is then suddenly so inflated as opposed to if i just strip something back and make something naturally gluten-free um, and as Hamish said, Asian food is generally so easy to adapt to being gluten-free naturally. So, um, yeah, I've found that that's a really good cost-saving measure. Um, and one thing that I did manage to get in two of my four years at university, and I don't know why this would have changed, but um, the disability allowance for, um, for gluten-free foods. And I know that this is something that, so many people struggle with and that there's quite a lot of inconsistency in terms of what the result is for people there even was for me i got it for two years and not the other two so given that my circumstance didn't change i'm not really sure why that is um but um if you're a student then you do it through study link as opposed to through wins um but yeah so um if anyone wants to flick me an email or anything about that um i just created when i was applying i went onto the countdown website and made a um a comparison i'd take a product say burger buns i'd cost that put a screenshot on of what that cost was and then find a gluten equivalent take the price difference and collate that all until it made up the amount for the disability allowance and then i'd send that plus receipts through um so that worked for me but i know that a lot of people find that difficult so that's probably a bit of a case-by-case -case sort of thing um maybe on to the next one lisa um so then kind of more this year um having transitioned from the student life into the professional working environment um so i work for a really large company um so we've got things like in-house catering um with the company for if we've got team events and things like that um so i guess like a first step for me was making myself known to like the the executive assistants and the those type of people who often end up organizing those sort of things making friends with them and then um letting them know that i'm celiac and what that kind of means and if we can pass it on to the catering team and things like that so again making friends with the people who are going to be able to go in and bat for you i guess is kind of the key thing that's really helped me along the way um another thing that i tend to do at work is put myself in the position of organizing things so if it's a leaving do or if it's a christmas do or end of financial year or whatever it is i generally try and be in the organizational committee or whatever for the event um so that I can have control over what the catering looks like. I can be in, I can be in contact with them. Um, and that's, I guess, giving me an element of control in a circumstance where you maybe otherwise don't have a lot of control. So um, yeah, I just find that making yourself, putting yourself forcibly in those conversations tends to help a lot. Um, and I guess more generally in terms of transitioning into the workplace, um, you've kind of got to acknowledge that it is a change in life and lifestyle. Um, and for me, you know, change in city again. Um, and 
to make sure that you're taking care of yourself and checking in with yourself on how you are, keeping in touch with your support networks. Um, because you can pretty easily get burnt out with those big changes, and particularly if you're working big hours. Um, so yeah, that's been an important part of my adjustment as well. Um, so yeah, that, that's the that's really what I have to say. But please feel free to ask me any questions if you have any. That was great, Rosie. 